everybody. <clears throat> I'm going to be talking about uh, real advances in mobile mal um, Android malware, and basically things that attackers are doing now to improve upon just sending out SMS messages. Uh, let's look at some numbers up first. Um, right now, what we see now is basically a mix between regular malware and uh, and what we call potentially unwanted uh, programs. These are your spyware, your adware, your your hack tools, things that you may or may not want on a uh, given platform. So I mean, it's roughly about 50-50. So it's it's not just malware. It's not just a bunch of things out there. there there's, a, there's a change now in what we're seeing amongst what attackers are doing. Uh, the actual breakdown. It's really not SMS numbers. Okay, SMS is really over. Uh, let's see how many. Uh, still a good percentage, but we're seeing a lot more and more attacks like uh, backdoor botnet attacks. Uh, Things that send out uh, use information uh, to an attacker, like uh, your your IMEI, your your uh, IMSI, your any basically uh, identities and identifiers that help help a uh, attacker identify your phone. You, these generally aren't used to basically attack your phone so much nowadays. We're seeing they're more designed to um, basically give the give an attacker a way to count how many infections they have. So if you're running a botnet, you say okay. I've got 100,000 infections, or I've got a million infections, and I can tell by the number of individual identifiers I've got. That's more what we're seeing now than the bigger numbers, than actually people just going, okay, we're going to send out a quick message or a quick uh, premium rate SMS message that, uh, that costs you like a, a buck a message. Something more than that. Okay, so, so say you're an attacker that's trying to like start up something like bypass the antivirus software or anti-malware software and, and get onto a phone or get undetected or go do whatever it takes. Uh, what kind of situations would those be? I mean, this would be like if you had your own, uh, if you had your own SMS sending coaching that sent out a bunch of SMS messages, you're going to get caught very quickly. And so there are ways to avoid that. Okay, or maybe you're running your own botnet. You're saying, okay, um, let me put it together and infect 100,000 hosts. Now, if you don't use special techniques, maybe encryption, some other other techniques like that, your co uh, your coworkers or your um, oh, sorry. Uh, um, I just pick it up? Okay. All right. Okay. Um, so a couple different ways we can look at this now. Uh, say you've got your own botnet and then someone takes over your botnet, you're in bad shape. So you'd want to use technique like encryption or something, some advanced technique in it to avoid someone else taking over your network or in invading your, your network of infected uh, devices. Okay, so now you've come up with, or maybe even better, maybe you've done something like, like uh, like, like John Oberheide and then uh, researcher Char Char Charlie Miller have done, where they put out an application that, that downloads code from, from their, their server, or in, in, in the case of an attacker, from the attacker server. But no one's going to run your code because it's not very interesting. So what are the different ways you can do that to get bypass detection and to bypass being boring? Let's take a look at this, these uh, tricks. First step, once again, uh, like the, uh, the botnet situation where You've got 100,000 hosts infected, and you've got a large network of, of victims there, and zombies, or whatever you want to call them. Um, the question is, how do you make sure that someone else doesn't come over and take over your, your account? You're not worried so much about being detected by antivirus or security software or whatnot, because you're making money. Why would you worry about that? You're worried more about someone ta taking over your, your, your cash flow and your network itself. So what do you do? You encrypt your network traffic rather than encrypting, like say, uh, each individual copy of your, your malware. So th these are simple things, like the, the, the very simple techniques and their advanced techniques. Simple techniques are like hiding your, your, your uh, what message you're sending or whatnot, or hiding uh, configuration files. Configuration files, like min minimal encryption, min like substitution cipher or something simple. Something just to avoid uh, someone else easily taking over your network and, and taking over, I guess. That's basically it. Um, uh, more complex techniques to use, like a, a, a better algorithm, like AES or DES or whatnot. Uh, Droid Dream, I believe, used uh, used DES, and it was basically designed just to encrypt the URLs it was using and to encrypt the traffic that was going over the network. They really weren't worried about it, anyone detecting them. So, so what's the deal? You use symmetric cipher. It's a very secure uh, algorithm, and you've got uh, the key stored in the in your file. Good to go. Can we detect this? Yes, we can. Not, not. These are not the most advanced techniques out there. Uh, okay. Minor thing. I was editing my slides earlier. That should actually read uh, recording calls. Basically, uh, there's malware out there that's able to record your calls. This was done initially by academic uh, uh, proof of concepts where they said, okay, let's see if we can record audio and, and do that. It took about six months after the academic proof of concepts for uh, to actually see malware in the wild doing that. And they've done things where they've gone after uh, 
interactive voice response and touch tones and all that. Not the most interesting parts. When we've seen them, we've seen a couple of different uh, variants. They do a little different technique, but it's basically all about recording audio. Not that impressive, not the interesting parts. Then we've got something like this, where malware updates. This is uh, two different ways we can do this. One is by actually um, having real updates, or, and the other one is pretend to be an update. And the pretend to be an update is, is basically what we'll cover a little later about fraud in, in, uh, as a technique in attacker trick. It's basically where you pretend to be a legitimate update for, let's say, uh, Angry Birds or for uh, uh, the actual Android operating system, and you're, you're trying to get on there. The main thing is, if you pretend to be a system update, when the user sees, oh, it's a system update, and it says, oh, it's requesting install packages or some other uh, high-level permission, you're, they're probably going to approve it because it's a system update. So I mean, it, it's, it's a little bit of social engineering there, and it helps you get on device. And that's actually something we see more often in, than not. In, in, uh, and as an attacker trick, it's, it's a low-level trick, very simple trick, but still enough people fall for it, so it, it comes out and um, it's quite successful. The other option was uh, malware updating itself. This is malware that actually has uh, ways of updating itself from an attacker's server. So it'll either contact a command and control server and say, OK, pull down on some uh, new code or new, new functionality or new techniques or something, or install someone else's software. We have an, up, uh, an example of that coming up a little bit later. Uh, take a look at that. OK. Um, right, so generally, um, real malware updates, they're not visual. You don't really see what's going on. And there's a, it's basically a, a neat technique that they've taken from legitimate software. Your antivirus software updates itself. Your, your uh, Windows updates itself. Uh, Microsoft Word updates itself. Why shouldn't malware, right? They're learning. OK. Uh, another concept in, in an attacker tricks is uh, rooting exploits. Rooting exploits are the same ones you use if you want to root your Android phone. So you say, OK, I want more access to my phone. I want to be able to do stuff with it. I'm just going to use one of the root exploits. And of course, malware authors are doing the exact same thing. They're saying, OK, why should I write my own exploit? Why should I go through all the effort of, of figuring out new techniques when the rooting community is already doing it for us? which is nice for the lazy uh, attackers, because they're just taking whatever you have, but bad for them also, because they, I, I'm not sure they realize this, but since these are public rooting exploits, all of us have access, including antivirus software and whatnot, and we can easily detect them. Uh, in the case of some of the major ones, we've got like uh, malware that's actually using the main uh, root exploits, just repackaging them and adding, uh, what is this? 18 exploit variants, 26 variants. These are variants where they've just changed the words, a few, a few words around, and included the original rooting exploit. It's not that complicated, not that difficult, but it's something they're doing more and more and often because uh, apparently it pays more to just reuse existing code. Another lesson learned from legitimate software development, but bad for them if you want to avoid detection. Something that's actually more functional. Um, fraud, basically. Fraud on, 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 on uh, malware. This is basically... Uh, different from what do you call in injecting code, I believe? Uh, yes. Right. This is completely different. This is where, where the application just pretends, or the malware pretends to be a legitimate application. So say it pretends to be a guitar tuning app. It'll, OK, it's an app that does guitar tuning. Not exactly. It just pretends it has enough code to pretend to be that. We've got two examples here, really. Uh, one is one-click fraud, where it, it pretends to be um, basically an adult entertainment app. And it really get, just makes uh, money off of the, uh, off of the victim. And then we have fake token, which pretends to be like uh, one of those two-factor authentication applications. So like if you've got Google um, Authenticator on your phone or you've got two-factor authentication uh, installed on your Google account, you'll have to ha fire up the uh, Google's Authenticator app and enter the code in into Google every time you log in. So in, in this case, fake token pretend to be one of those same kind of enter the token uh, applications for a bank, or actually a number of banks. And it really wasn't one of those. It, it didn't generate. Uh, it didn't generate a new code, like like you would expect on like an RSA token or something like that, where it just repeats every minute or so. It'll give you a new six-digit code. It just gives you a random code. You enter your password, and, and all it does is forward the password onto the attacker. So it's very tricky, very sneaky, but it really doesn't do what it, it's supposed to be doing. It's it's just fraud. It just pretends to be something. Um, actual example of fake token, pretty much. It was uh, customized for a lot of. I think two to three different banks, and it had code really just to like, okay, put your password in and it gives you a fake code. Really nice concept, really simple thing. Actually got a few people. I think it affected a few, um, a good number of people. Neat technique and good enough, just good enough of an app to be able to pull that off, but not good enough to be an actual token app because that would be work. And I think we've seen so far since you know, with the rooting exploits and with the encryption, 
malware authors really aren't about the work. They're about making the money. If they can make the money, they're not gonna do any more extra work. Uh, now onto one-click fraud, which is the adult application, uh, or fake adult application. It's supposed to take you to a, a, um, an adult entertainment site, but instead it puts out a message every five minutes that telling the user, okay, give us some money. You know, because you're like gonna be a real reported please, something along those lines, I forget the exact translation. And it basically what it did was it take information from you, it would take your uh, Google account number and a few other identifiers to be able to track each of the, in the infections. So tracking the infections and tracking the user and finding a way to get you to basically pay them. It would basically open up the fake website and have you give, up, give you a message saying, okay, pay for further access or pay so we don't turn you into the police. Now, neat technique. You ask, who would fall for an app that doesn't really do anything, it doesn't get you anywhere, it doesn't even give you what it claims to give you? Who would fall for that? Quite a few people. Um, we actually saw, we, detection's not a problem, we detected, but about, what's it, two, is that number right? 211 people actually fell for this? And they picked up about $265,000 in, in actual profits from people paying for this, uh, basically this um, extortion, basically. The bad guys are trying to extort you for installing some adult entertainment software, and, and they picked up a whole bunch of money. And did anyone get in trouble for this? Yes, because extortion is illegal. And it's something that people can track more easily than not. I mean, especially when you're seeing that, that, kind, of, that kind of money. That's a lot of money. It's, I mean, it looks much more impressive in yen, you know, 21 million yen. But still, it's quite a bit of money. Uh, so six people got picked up and they got arrested. It was kind of neat to see the see an actual ending result of a malware prosecution, where and in one of these six people was the actual original author of the malware. So, what have we learned so far? Malware authors are lazy. Uh, they all like to make money, and yes, they will get caught if they get too greedy. <laughs> so I mean, we're learning quite a few things here about tricks. <clears throat> Another t technique that they've gotten that the malware authors on, on Android at least have gotten from the PC side is uh, server-side polymorphism. Fancy words to say basically they change up every time you go to a, a given URL for the malware, you get a different copy of the uh, of the malware, your own personalized copy. How personal? It doesn't have your name in it, but it's designed to like they've changed a few strings, they changed the little size on it. I mean, in the case of this, this this one here, um, it's gone from about 300 uh, kilobytes to about 500 kilobytes. But basically, the internals are completely identical. If you actually take apart, <coughs> excuse me. If you actually unpack these uh, Android applications, you'll find out the base of the code's virtually identical. The only things that have changed are uh, increase in, say, the, uh, the manifest file for all three of these. Just enough to change the name of the application internally when you install it and uh, size-wise. So not a huge bunch of things. Very simple thing to do on the attacker side, cost-wise. All they, they have to do is basically script uh, changes to, the, to certain files and then repack the files and then give you a new download. That can be done in a few seconds with a script. You wouldn't even notice, you click the link and you get your link in, a, in about a minute. No, not a minute, I'm sorry, a few seconds, really. So every time you come in, every day, every hour, you get a new version. So we collect a few of these and then we've added detection to say, okay, why don't we just detect the files that don't change and we pick up all the rest. And so, so while that's very nice initially for an attacker and it's very lazy for them to change it with a script, it doesn't do as much as they think it does. And it did, but it is a nice concept initially, especially if, if, if people are just hashing files or whatnot, they're not gonna catch that. If you detect actual file changes and whatnot and, and uh, unchanging code in the file, you'll pick it up. Things like we've done on the PC side for years. Uh, so, so far we've learned that uh, malware authors like to make money, they're, they're very lazy, and they, they commit the crimes and are kind of stupid. So sometimes criminals are stupid if, when they're greedy. I mean, some people, some are more complicated, and we'll see a little bit more examples of people who are a little bit better at that. But so far we've seen are people who are not that good at it yet. But these are good techniques. They're nice techniques that, that did work in certain circumstances and when done properly. <coughs> and so one major example, though, of that is Android Fake Installer, which I think we're up to, well, we're currently more than 25 at the moment, different variants. These are variants that are very similar, but they have changed enough to make it a little different for detection, more so than the uh, hundreds and thousands of other uh, server-side variants they have there. These are ones that are actually much different. And actually, we might actually have a generic detection for most of these. But uh, essentially, they ch change up, uh, this is the, um, this the thing over here is basically a decompiled Android manifest file. They're including every single one of your, your uh, applications, and they tell you what the application is and what kind of permissions it wants, things like that. And the thing that things that change really are um, uh, pretty much names and uh, a few other things in there. So minor changes, easily scriptable, really simple, and that's kind of what they're doing now. 
something more fun, though. <coughs> a more interesting technique is um, injecting code into a legitimate application. This is very similar to the fraud application, where you have an application uh, or an app that's doing something bad. And instead of the fraud, where it's a completely fake app that's going to be something that it isn't, this it takes a real application and a real application and basically injects its own malicious code into it, like like a standard uh, PC virus that infects uh, other executables, other files, other programs. In this case, it's not actually an actual uh, file infecting virus. This has actually been installed into, let's say, 20 or 30 different applications, much like Droid Dream was initially. In this case, we're talking about something called uh, initially Android Mogava, and we called it Android Stamper after we found another variant that did almost exactly the same thing. In this case, we're talking about an Iranian food app that pretends to be, um, oh no, sorry, it's a real Iranian food application. So if you're interested in getting recipes for a number of dishes, it would give them to you. It really would. In the background, though, it's doing something else entirely. It's got code in it for basically um, going after pretty much every every uh, photo on your every JPEG on your on your SD card. It scans the entire entire SD card for every single photo, and <coughs> stamps a copy of uh, the Ayatollah Khomeini onto every one of your pictures. So you've got family photos, you got your, your 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 friends and family, and maybe a family picture, and boom, there's Ayatollah in the corner. Maybe you're walking on the beach. You got a picture of you and your 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 your, your, your significant, significant other walking on the beach, and boom, the Ayatollah and his guards are there. Fascinating concept, really hilarious. When, if, as long as it hasn't ruined your 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 only copy of your your personal photos, but kind of funny. Um, in this case, the code injection is basically just a small little portion of code injected into a legitimate application. Got a lot of legitimate code because it's a real thing, and it's got a little bit that isn't. Uh, the thing is, is that unlike uh, on the PC side where a virus actually learns uh, that it's infected something, it'll mark a, a particular application or program and says, "Okay, I've infected this one already. I put a mark in there." I've infected that, so I won't infect it again. This one's a little buggy, doesn't even check for that. Just odd. So, I mean, once again, malware writers like to make money, like to do funny things, like to do a lot of things, and they're kind of lazy. Seems a bit of a pattern on Android. I, I don't know. Maybe it's just me. Um, the point is, since it doesn't actually check it's infecting every single file or every single photo over and over again, it eventually pushes the size up of the file, so it goes from, like, a, say, a few hundred K to maybe a megabyte or so, so it's really large, it takes up disk space, it fills up your entire SD card. And also, it, it damages your photos because the only thing solid is the uh, picture of the Ayatollah. Okay, <coughs> okay in, uh, in the case of uh, yeah, in the case of the, this is code here. We got this little picture here of the Ayatollah and his guards here. Um, so the code basically takes a, grabs every image uh, and stamps this photo onto the corner of every one of your, photo, uh, your pictures. So it has code for that. It has absolutely no code whatsoever to check it's infected. And let's see an actual example of what that looks like. Let's, let's start with this main picture. Here's a picture of President Obama. Here's the president of the picture of President Obama when infected first generation. Hey, look at that. It's the Ayatollah. Love, look at him. Uh, a, a little a few generations later, the Ayatollah's looking fresh. Obama's looking a bit peaked. I, I don't know. It's damaging the picture. And let's look at like a few more generations up. Ayatollah's still looking good. Totally fading away. I mean, it's like if, if you've seen the uh, uh, Back to the Future, it's when Marty starts disappearing when his uh, parents don't get together, you know? It's a bit like that. Maybe that's the too old a reference. Okay. Point is, the, the Ayatollah gets bigger and bigger, or, or it's stronger apparently in this case, and your photos start to fade away. But the size of your pictures get bigger and bigger. This is a side effect. It, it, this is something similar. This is version B of that 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 app or that that malware. This is a, a Japanese pop group. Uh, I think it's AKB48 or something along those lines. They have about more than it's sort of like American Idol or something like that. Mm. But it's like they've got about 60 members. 48 used to be what they used to be, the size of their, their membership. Uh, basically, they have a traveling band or where you have about four or five of them that travel around the country and then sing music. Uh, Casey, every year there's like a contest to vote on your favorite bands. So there was an app that allowed you to basically follow the elections where, where fans could vote on who do they want to be in there, who do they want to be the current touring band. And they had this app. And, and they actually, this little picture is the replaces the Ayatollah. And get stamped on all your pictures. The trick was the app pretended to be that that app that lets you monitor who's winning the elections of this particular band, but instead it, it actually just posted this picture here. 
Now this picture is not totally unrelated. This is a picture from a, an, another AKB48 contest uh, a year before where you could see, or not a contest, but, a, but a, like another app that let you see how you as a fan of AKB48, how you, a picture of you and a picture of one of the members of AKB48, well, what, what, would, what would your baby, what your baby if, be if you mix them together? This was a, with a sumo wrestler and one of the members. So it was a uh, kind of a somewhat creepy looking baby. Put on every one of your pictures, all throughout, all your pictures on the disc, every, on the disc, everywhere, all around you, just there. And it was, it, it's funny. The, 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 that's actually the most interesting part because literally the code was uh, completely identical. If you compare this to the previous screen, it's completely identical. The only thing that's changed is the picture, nothing else. So once again, lazy malware authors, they're not trying very hard, not so much. The, the ones who are really trying to make money in malware and in Android malware in general, are the ones who are running botnets and attempting to make money or resell traffic, just the same way you do on a PC where you infect hundreds of thousands of computers and you resell the services of those infected devices or infected computers to other criminals. That's really the only way you make money doing this. Um, otherwise you get in trouble or you make no money or you get caught. Um, <clears throat> this is actually something a little more advanced what I was referring to, uh, Android Backscript.a. This is basically a, um, a fake version, it was injected, code injected into a number of near real applications. This specific version is an Angry Birds version, uh, Angry Birds Space, and so it's not really Angry Birds Space, it's just Angry Birds Space, well actually, it's Angry Birds Space plus malicious code. And the nice thing about the malicious code, or the interesting thing about the malicious code is that it downloads the additional attack code. And the additional attack code isn't Android code, na native Android code, it, <coughs> excuse me, um, it's a, uh, it's basically embedded JavaScript. In this case, uh, it uses um, code from Fscript ME, which is uh, a JavaScript to uh, J2 ME converter. So basically, you write your, your code, your script in JavaScript, and it gets loaded by this uh, Fscript ME in the loader and runs in the context of the application. So you can basically embed or code all your attacks and whatnot in JavaScript and instead of running, writing them in, in actual Java, which is loads easier if you've only ever learned how to program the web. Okay, uh, so basically it loaded it, this, this application, once you run it, it installs itself, it sends the, um, your IMEI, IMZ, a bunch of different identifiers to the attackers, they know what, who, they, who they've been infected. So they can track their, basically their botnet. So they'll infect maybe 100,000 different um, uh, people, maybe a million people, depends how many, how, how well they get along. And then they, since they're using encryption here for their, their code, for the, uh, for the JavaScript gets downloaded, it's like, okay, that's great. That, that protects it over the network. So if, if someone's uh, using, uh, I guess, uh, Wireshark or something to monitor the network and see what's, what kind of traffic is going over, or, or basically they're, they're, they're trying to intercept, they'll, they'll, all they'll see is the encrypted traffic. They don't have the key unless they have a sample of the cop, um, a copy of the malware, uh, meaning an infected bot, bot client that has the key. So when we analyze it, we have the copy of the, uh, of the uh, malware and we can take a look and we know what's going on and we can watch the traffic going on. The attackers, uh, or the attackers' competitors in this case, the, the botnet owner's competitors, don't. So they're, they're kept out. Um, in this case, um, the actual code that's embedded in the application doesn't do all the work. All that does is provide an infrastructure to run the uh, downloaded code. So when it downloads the code, it downloads the uh, command and control code from the server, from the attacker server, brings it back down onto the phone and, and implements a few commands. It's not very malicious at the, at the moment, but currently it's able to uh, down, down, uh, run, install and uh, download an APK or download an APK, meaning download an another application from the, uh, fr from the attacker server and then place it on, the, uh, uh, on, on, the, on your device, on your SD card. Um, <coughs> and also it's able to run, and, uh, run, basically send you to other websites and download and install software. So basically click fraud and install fraud. It's a nice technique, and it's a good way to make money because, okay, installs can generate money. Paper install, paper install generates money for, for people and attackers and whatnot. So they do it on a PC all the time where they'll install, like, oh, maybe that, that icon program or some other kind of program on your PC. Costs them nothing. It costs you nothing, but it gets them a, a, a commission from the uh, person doing the paper installs. They pay per install. Um, in this case, uh, we're looking at something like this. It'll pop up a, a web view of basically uh, one application while it's really installing a, th uh, a second application that's already on your, on your device. Very neat technique where you have this on the SD card. 
a little bit more advanced than the other one. It's basically a solid install of software that you don't necessarily want on there. Once again, potentially unwanted programs. Not really malware, but really things that you don't want on your device. And it's already on disk, and you want to get rid of it. But that's another story. Uh, point is, this is software that actually stays under the radar, doesn't do any damage to your system, doesn't cause a lot of problems, uh, encrypts your traffic so they can't be taken over easily, and is able to be updated on the fly just by downloading a script from the attacker. I mean, they can, right now it just does two, two things basically. One, one was installing the initial uh, adware, and second was uh, basically clicking on links and installing uh, software. Two things. Okay, so how about we do another one? What are possible future improvements? Things that would be good for the attacker. May not make the money, but good for them. Like say something destructive, like wiping off someone's phone. Destructive, not, doesn't make you any money. Maybe not a great idea, but they can do that. Um, another thing is reselling uh, malware installations or reselling other installations. So you start with one program that you install, Maybe they can install four more programs for somebody else. They can resell, I say they have a botnet of 100,000 users. I picked that as a number, but they could be a million. Uh, it depends how, how good your initial install is. <coughs> and in this case, what we need to do is, okay, um, I have a 100,000 botnet uh, available, um, uh, what do you call, cell phone botnet available for you. I'll charge you, say, 20 cents for each install. So. You give me the package, I'll send it out to my, my network, and I'll install on all of these devices, and you'll get the credit from your uh, paper install um, provider, or your commission from your, whoever's selling you that software. So it works out that every, every person in the chain, so there's the people selling their software, the people wanting to make a commission on that software, and the person who has the botnet. So you've got a bunch of people making money on this entire transaction. And interestingly enough, not getting caught because it, it, they're not actually doing damage, they're not actually stealing money from banks or whatnot. So it's a lot harder to track them because it's, the, I guess, low-hanging fruit or, or something along those lines where it's not as bad as it could be. But it, it, it could be, it always get worse, always get worse, but we haven't seen that to date. And we have seen a trend actually where people are saying, okay, and attackers are saying, it's better to make the money than to get in trouble. So they'll, they'll, they'll hit, lay, uh, say, a million users for a, a buck a piece, and that's a million bucks. Do they need more than that? No, they'll hit another than a couple of users or do a different technique. It's, it's more of a hit and run than a, a stay and wait and run something like that fake, uh, fake uh, one-click fraud one where you get arrested. So a little better than that. Let's actually look at a couple more things, um, academic and professional research. Uh, something like this. This is uh, not as complicated, but it's gets hard to get there. Uh, there was a version of something called Soundcomer which was able to read like... Um, I mentioned that earlier. Actually, uh, probably more closely would be something called TouchLogger. That's actually mentioned at the bottom. Um, this is basically software that reads like, uh, wh whenever you have like an Android phone and you have the soft keyboard or any, any device like that, uh, every time, if you hold the phone in your hand and you, and you tap the, uh, the keyboard with your fingers, at some point, um, I mean, the sensors built into the phone, like your motion sensors or whatnot, they move a bit. They move enough and enough of a pattern that you can detect any given user typing in, say, the digits one through nine. Something easy like that. Very neat concept. Yeah, it's like, it makes sense, and, and they've actually done the research on this, and it works. Uh, in the first instance, TouchLogger, it, it was basically two pieces of uh, Andro Android software. One that was a trading software would learn the particular patterns of uh, movement caused by a, a, a one individual typing in numbers and a second one that used that training data to basically figure out when you, this user was typing in their password or their, or their passcode or whatever it takes to unlock their phone. Mm, and that was a nice concept, but it was bulky because you had two pieces. Uh, this new new variation, TapLogger, puts everything in one place and adds a little front end on there where it's now you're playing a little icon matching game that happens to have the icons all in the range of the um, zero through, um, I'm sorry, one through nine or zero through nine and the uh, other, like the uh, asterisk and the, and the pound key, you know. Oh, all the keys, it happens to be right in the same location. You'll see it's right in the same, very neat concept, but you're instead you're playing a game. So it's engaging and it gets you to uh, do, basically train the software on how you press the buttons on your, on your keypad. So when you lock your phone, the attacker gets access to all your, your information. Neat concept, totally academic at the moment. I mean, yes, this is a, an improvement on other academic software, uh, about six months in there. We haven't yet seen that in the wild in malware. Not sure why. Probably because there's not a lot of money in taking over any given one, f uh, given Android phone, unless you can sell ad clicks or 
go further, like or you know, we've seen before where people try to take over, or Bonnie will try to take over the. Oh, one second. Uh, you have a question? Okay, the question was, how many users who their, who, uh, their passcode to unlock their phone, say it's a 4 to pin, how many of those are the same as, as, the, uh, as their bank or ATM pin? That's a good question. I don't actually know, but it's it, it, like the case of real passwords and other passwords you use in different accounts, there's a lot of repetition. And my, my friend here is an actual uh, pen tester, so I mean, you, this is actual... Uh, <laughs> we're, we're Okay, if you have enough information on the user to, to be able to install this, you can do what exactly? You've got a lot more to go with, you're saying? Okay. And you possibly have their ATM pen. Yes, okay, I agree with that. Yes, that's very likely. This is the truth. Truth from a pen tester does this every day. <laughs> yes, it's truth, yes. If you use your, uh, a common pen, you'll probably use it more than one place and possibly on your phone. So this, once again, argues for using this in malware. But we still haven't seen that. It, this might be tied into what this pattern we're seeing where the attackers are enjoying just doing silly things and making quick a quick buck and not really trying hard on their own. It's not like they're, the, the attackers are putting their own R&D into uh, developing exploits or developing new new techniques like, like this, this software like this, that reads your pin, something like that. They don't, they don't quite have that. Who's actually doing this work? Academics, uh, other researchers, uh, people like... Uh, Okay, this is actually an overview of what that does, and to maybe give you a little bit of a better idea of, of the touching and the pushing of the buttons. But it, it is the same concept, and, and truthfully, if you use your pin and your password in one place, you m very likely will use it somewhere else. Let's actually look at two other re interesting researchers, uh, John Oberheide and then Charlie Miller. I mentioned them earlier. Uh, so these two guys, they're really good at, at going after mobile phones. They, they do some interesting things. Uh, uh, John put together an app uh, a few years ago and, 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 uh, at SummerCon, he announced it, uh, called Eclipse Trap. This was basically a piece of uh, software that pretended to be, uh, it pretended to be an, an, what do you call it, a preview app for the latest uh, uh, Twilight movie. I think it was Eclipse at the time, that's why Eclipse Trap. So it was a preview app to show you like, what's going on in the new movie. This is, a, once again, playing on the, on the fact that it's a very popular movie, there are a lot of people who want, want this app, they're probably going to download it. What did it actually do? It was just a uh, fake app that did just enough to show you that, oh yeah, we're like an Eclipse uh, thingy, uh, an Eclipse preview app. But meanwhile, it was downloading uh, native code from um, Oberheide server. So kind of like what we saw with, uh, with back Backscript, where it downloads code from the attacker server, it was able to download exploits and code from um, a John server. Now Charlie, did, uh, Charlie Miller did something very similar uh, a few years later, on, I think it was on, on the iPhone actually. It was a stock market app that was able to download code from, um, from his server. Neat techniques. So d these are two guys who are really good at, at doing interesting things on mobile phones. I mean, I mean, Charlie really is the guy who was known for the first Google uh, Android uh, exploit and I think the first uh, public uh, iPhone exploit. So these are guys who know what they're doing. They actually looked at, at um, Google's bouncer uh, technology. Uh, Bouncer is a thing that uh, Google provided to basically provide some kind of, um, I guess, uh, vetting for, for Android apps. So, you know, we see, uh, we see uh, people talk a lot about, oh, Android's so open. Yeah, you can get whatever you want into the, into the app market, and it could be malware, it could be anything, it could be a lot of bad stuff out there. Where's the protection? In this case, um, uh, Google's Bouncer technique was, or Bouncer's, uh, what, what's the proper term for this? It, it, it's in the name, really. If you're at a nightclub and there's a guy at the door saying you can come in, you can't come in, that's basically what the software is. It tells you that you can or cannot be an application in the App Store in or in the uh, Google Play Market, it's called now, I think. Uh, the problem is, at least from security research uh, side of security researchers and, and people who are interested in security in general, is that it's, it's security through uh, obscurity. It's like saying, okay, no one knows anything about this amazing bouncer we have that protects you from all of the... Uh, from all of the applications, uh, they know nothing about it, so they can't break into it, they can't bypass it. That's, this is good, right? Not really, especially when you have two guys like uh, Charlie and John, who know a lot of stuff. They basically fixed this uh, last problem here. They produced uh, basically uh, an app that, that was uh, submitted to the market, 
and it was able to uh, basically provide them a connect back shell into the <laughs> into the uh, Google's network. So what they found out was one, Google runs these apps uh, in your app on their internal network. Two, it has access to the, uh, in the internet. Uh, that's how they were able to connect back to themselves. Uh, three, they found out they had a few things, interesting things like the, uh, I think there's a picture of Lady Gaga in there. Um, and there's, a, there's like one contact in there. I mean, it's uh, like uh, they found out the email address of the uh, Google account on, the, on, their, on, their, on their device or emulator or phone. I mean, they were able to discover a whole bunch of things from the, from the background. And they were also able to detect accidentally because they happened to be running when a live person was testing, uh, testing the apps. He said, Google uses live people to test the apps as well. And they noticed that <laughs> these guys were connecting back and touching the uh, files and looking around. And it's like, good concept. Maybe you should not do that while you're on there. But, but the point is, it's a, the Google's bounce is like a really, really good, good start. Very good start compared to not having security of any kind. So it is an improvement. It's getting there. It's not quite there yet. They, they could help if they did a little bit more um, uh, communication between uh, researchers like Charlie and John and uh, to provide basically input on how to secure a situation like that. Like, okay, you've got a bunch of malware on there. It's not sufficient to run uh, just uh, one or two scanners or whatnot, or it's not enough to just have people run them, um, to, to run, run the apps manually. Because uh, what, 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 uh, what these, these two guys kind of came up with was basically saying, if you run, run your app for about five minutes and do nothing, I wait, for you, wait to do the malicious actions until after about five minutes, you're pretty much bypass the entire bouncer process initially. <laughs> Obviously, Google improves upon their older techniques. Like when their, their audio recaptures got cracked, they've improved upon that as well. So I mean, they've got people, they've got a lot of good work, and they're doing well. But this is the initial concept, and, and it's interesting. The interesting thing is that this is what's being done by researchers, professional researchers, and academic researchers, and, and not actually criminals. That's the really interesting part of all of this, is that the criminals aren't really doing anything at all malicious. They're there just to make money, and it's, it's a good time for them now. It's a bit like with the, doing the, I guess, it's like having a, a Windows PC before we had all the protections, before we had all the fancy malware, before we were all uh, had the fancy defenses for fancy malware. It's like getting in on the ground floor for them. They don't have to try hard yet because we don't have enough security infrastructure in place. We don't have enough uh, security software. We don't have enough things in the back end on the network. We don't have all these in place yet. But the, the time is coming and um, Eventually, what happens is that the bad guys will get better, much like the Backscript.a, uh, much like a few other botnet controllers and, and whatnot. They're getting better. They're going to get better. And we have to basically go after them and basically provide more security. And I think that's the last thing about it. Are there any questions on that, actually, on any of these?
Sit up here, dude.
inside in here that tells you to pretend I'm in it for the next little bit. We're going to go ahead and get started. This is the hilarious Matt Johnson really? with PowerShell Be a Cool Blue Kid. Really? The hilarious. Hello? Hi. All right, cool. Let's do this. All right, uh, this is my talk, PowerShell Be a Cool Blue Kid. Uh, let's get started. Here's some of the stuff we're going to go through. I'm going to give you a little intro of myself. You really have to actually listen to that. Uh, some basics of PowerShell. We'll go over some files and file system stuff, as well as user access, a little bit of systems management, and then some wrap-up. I, I'm a system analyst for a nonprofit organization in uh, Southeast Michigan. I'm also the founder of the PowerShell, Michigan PowerShell's Users Group, which is kind of not doing anything right now, so that, that's hopefully going to change later this year. I am a moderator on the Hey Scripting Guy forums. If you're not familiar with the Hey Scripting Guy uh, website at Microsoft, it is an area to help you go learn PowerShell. gives you um, actually things you can use in your job instead of here's a variable, print a variable. It's actually really cool. But they have a forums, and uh, I'm a moderator on there. As well as a judge, Microsoft has scripting games every year to help you learn PowerShell, uh, either from basic or advanced. Uh, judging is fun, but it's, that's a lot of scripts. So uh, you should try it out if you want to use PowerShell, learn PowerShell. Um, you, it's really cool. I'm a member of MySec. Um, whether they like it or not. <laughs> I'm an avid gamer and a huge sports fan, so if my phone goes off in the middle of here, it's probably the White Sox losing. And I'm, yeah, yeah. And uh, I'm a father to a future hacker. Uh, he does crazy things that I didn't even think a two-year-old could do yet, and a husband to a wonderful wife who has him this weekend, and I feel bad for her. I'm not an expert. Uh, I like to pretend I am, but I'm really not. I'm really my sex PowerShell expert, and yeah, they they probably suffer through that. There's a ton of sysadmin stuff in here. It's blue side. Uh, that's what I am normally do. I don't do red side. So, we'll, but a lot of sysadmin stuff does tend to technically translate over to the blue side. My employer doesn't feel this way, or either does Microsoft. I feel like every slide has to have that line in there, so that's why that's there. And as you find out, I think I'm funny, and I talk too fast. So get over it. If you don't like it, there's the doors. So, all right. Let's get going. You, anyway, hopefully you all have seen this if you use Windows 7 and up. It's in the other versions of Windows as well. But you need, should use this. looks like a DOS window, but it's a lot cooler than the DOS window. If you haven't heard, what PowerShell is, is a task automation framework. I automate basically everything uh, from tweeting at these guys down here in my sec to uh, sending my wife the grocery list. It's installed in every Microsoft operating system. It is getting better, uh, so much better. You, once you start using PowerShell and Manage Windows, there is n literally, you're going to wonder why they haven't done this in years. I heard someone comment today saying that PowerShell makes Windows actually usable. Well, <laughs> I said, well, that's kind of cool. <laughs> and the current version is 3.0. I have some 3.0 stuff in the very end here, but uh, it's still new, and I didn't want to give you guys that stuff. So there is tons of support. I support everything on here except the compellent one on here. The compellent one's on here because I'm going to do a talk later this year or next year uh, with Wolfgang Gorlick, uh, some DevOps stuff. But it is, there is deep integration with all these products. You can, ba I, I don't remember the last time I opened actually a GUI to manage half those products, which is kind of cool. All right, we're going to go over some little basic uh, language stuff. If you uh, know what PowerShell is, you can check your phone for the next little bit. A commandlet is like a command, but uh, it's a lot cooler. It is, uh, that's Microsoft's actual definition, but it is a command. You can make your own, which we'll get into in a couple minutes. That's when you read about PowerShell, you're going to hear the commandlets. It is, uh, there's some examples up here, like get help, write host, register event object. It's, it's a very simple thing to pick up and learn. You type in git dash command, it'll give you a whole bunch of commands, and it's actually 
you can look at it and see what you want to, you know, you can find out what you want to do. There's a naming convention. When you get scripts or download stuff off the internet that is PowerShell, it should follow the verb noun format. If it doesn't, then you might want to point them to the verb and the here's how to write PowerShell code stuff. But it's, uh, you'll, see a, you'll see a lot of people don't use it. But there is a naming convention, and you should stick by it. There's 98 verbs that Microsoft uses, like show, get, register, stop, terminate. I never use terminate, but that's cool. Uh, then there's aliases for those people who don't want to type out git dash mailbox. There, I believe that's a G M B. Um, there's uh, git child item is actually dir. That's the PowerShell version of dir, but you can type dir and it'll do the same thing. Or ls for you uh, Unix guys. You should not use. This is just a side note. Don't use aliases in your scripts because if you share it and someone's like, "What the heck is that?" It makes it easier to read if you type the full command name. So. And you want to see all the aliases, git dash alias. You can make your own too. So if you don't like to type, you can make your own. You can alias your whole thing if you want. And git help is your friend. Uh, make sure that you, <laughs> thanks Chris, uh, you use git help. I use it all the time. If I'm not typing git help once a day, uh, I'm, not, I'm not trying. Yes, they do. Uh, tab completion is in the console and the built-in editor. They give you a po editor too, which is really cool. It will now version three will tab complete in the editor. So, and it'll, t and IntelliSense too. Yes, IntelliSense. All you people who use IDEs, IntelliSense is like awesome. Wolf likes IntelliSense. There, uh, for the Unix guys, don't worry. You can type things you know, man, cat, CP, LS. There's, uh, there's multiple aliases for a lot of commands. I, it's kind of, I think it's kind of weird, but whatever makes people happy. Now we're going to talk about running scripts real quick. Out of the box, you download a script from my website, my GitHub site, whatever, you won't be able to run it. You have to change execution policy. And when this first came out, people were like, oh man, it's a security feature to stop you run, uh, run scripts. And then people like Relic pop up or uh, Matt who writes the... Uh, PowerSploit module show that, yeah, really, when you run PowerShell.exe, you can say bypass the execution policy. Execution policy is just basically stops you from doing something stupid, like out of the box. You can get by it, but uh, it's, yeah, it's there. You can set it system-wide or based on user. I'm a fan of just setting it by user instead of globally doing that. Uh, there's a switch and a command that you can run, but that's on the internet, and we're not going to cover that today. And it is not a security measure. It's just to stop dumb people from being dumb. This is what I love about PowerShell, is you can make tools. How many times have you like, man, I wish I had something that I could do to do, you know, I have X, I need to repeat it a million times. I, it's what I do a lot of the time. I make my scripts reusable, shareable. I share them on my blog. I share them with my sec members. I share them all over the time. That is one of the awesome things about this. Then there's a huge community beside, behind making tools and sharing tools. There's Poshcode, there is the Microsoft site for getting scripts, there's tons of different places. So this literally is, it's like you know, bash scripting or batch scripting, but it's, there's a lot more formal stuff behind it. This is part of that, modules. Modules are a bunch of scripts or a compiled uh, code. There's some other stuff that you can put that put together to make and share those tools. One of the examples I have later is I have a module to help edit host files. And it's just three functions that are pieced together that I can import into my session and uh, go along. Well, I'll show you guys that in a little bit. It is good for repackaging scripts and sharing scripts. PSCX, which uh, Wolf mentioned in his .NET talk earlier, is a great collection of scripts and it's always updated. Office 365, you can manage the entire uh, online web version of Microsoft software via that way. And NTFS security is another cool one that we'll get into here in a minute. How many times have you run a command and wish that you knew what happened, what the output was? PowerShell has these two wonderful commands built in called start and stop transcript. They will record your command and the output 
for everything you do. So say uh, you're uh, changing a bunch of users over to a group. You can log that whole thing so you have actually a backup of what you did. So you can go back and say, yeah, I actually moved that on this day at this time. So it's, it's really cool. A couple last minute notes. Uh, I don't know how many people are familiar with programming and yada, yada, yada. Everything's an object, which means that you can take it and pipe it using the pipeline and keep on manipulating stuff until the end. Usually when you build a PowerShell statement, the end thing is always your formatting. So I'm going to take users, I'm going to modify them, and then I'm going to print them out into a text file that I did all this work. Pipeline, like in Unix, Linux, it'll, you can uh, pipe one command to another to uh, get to do variable things. All variables are uh, prefixed by a dollar sign. You can name them anything you want, except there's some special variables. I don't recall how many there are, but uh, there's the do underscore dollar sign, which is the current thing in the pipeline, or true and false. And, yada, yada. and anything in this talk works in version 2 or above. So let's talk about file permissions. I don't know about you guys, but I hate file permissions. It's like literally it's a pain in my ass. I don't like it. You can, uh, GUI, yeah, okay, and xcals and cals, we all, I mean, at least I know a lot of people know how to use them, but they're really not user friendly. They really aren't. So built into PowerShell, there's git and set ACL. These things are painful to use at best, and I'll show you an example of that in a second. But it, you really, if you're using this, you are, uh, I, you know, you might want to be drinking on lunch. <laughs> All right. So here's a demo of uh, actually how bad the permissioning in <laughs> Windows uh, for PowerShell for uh, this is. Here we're going to create a directory real quick. Yeah, look, it already exists. Well, that's okay. We're going to, this is the command to get uh, the ACL list for that folder. And format list is going to print it into a thing that we can easily read. You see here, there's a whole bunch of stuff. Administrators, NT system, and authenticated users. Basically, this is the default uh, access. So here I'm going to store the ACLs into a variable so that I can act upon them. Here is uh, this right here. We're going to say that uh, we're going to set access rule protection. It is just something you have to do in there. It's uh, not, I've never ever changed that. So here's what the next thing we're going to do is we're going to set a rule. That this is an access control rule that gives domain admin full control over that directory. That is how long? That is painful to type a command prompt. Just literally painful. Here's another, and then this right here, this command will add it to this variable so that we can make sure that that gets applied. We're going to go through and do this again for domain users, and they're going to get the modify permission. We're going to add it to the rule. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah, my demo didn't work. It did earlier today. So basically what this is going to do is it is, when it w does work, and eh, demo gods, I taunted them earlier, uh, this basically will set all those permissions on here. All those lines just to set permissions on there, that's, that's just, that's painful to me. So... You can script it, you could put it in there. If you're going to do the same permissions over and over, you could write a script and send it a folder variable and off it goes and it'll permission that folder for you. Or you can write a function and pass it off. Uh, I have uh, two functions included in my, uh, on my GitHub thing in here that actually takes and removes uh, the permission to use USB on a, uh, on a computer. So uh, I had to do it for some DOD project that I was working on. Uh, but really, basically, to use this, you have to spend some time in the MSDN documentation. And I don't know how many of you really like MSDN documentation. I don't. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, look at that. Wolf likes it, too. You guys might want to bond. Just 
he does. Yeah, he, both people have Google as their homepage. Wolf has MSDN. So. <laughs> hey. <laughs> there, is, uh, there is some help, though. And uh, this gentleman, Raymond Andre uh, from Microsoft, made a uh, nice little PowerShell module to, uh, to help out with this. So I'm going to show you a little easier how this uh, actually goes. But first, I'm going to delete that folder. <laughs> 